Hey everybody, and welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today, we will be watching Epic History TV's Belisarius, Defeat of the Goths. So this is the next episode uh, in Epic History TV's series on Belisarius. Uh, this is actually the second most recent uh, video. Uh, the next video in this series uh, is the most recent one they've uploaded. So after we get to that one, you know, we'll have to <laughs> wait patiently for a new video to be uploaded. So, uh, in the last episode in this series, we saw Belisarius uh, reconquer Rome. You know, his triumphant reconquest of southern Italy and Rome. Um, you know, it was a pretty big, symbolic moment for Belisarius and Justinian. But, we ended off that episode with, you know, maybe everything isn't as good as it seems. You know, there was some mention of competition with Belisarius from within the Empire... Justinian's suspicions of Belisarius, uh, a familiar enemy reappearing in the east. So uh, I think we're going to get into a lot of that in this video, and we are going to see uh, more conflict between the Romans and the Goths over the fate of the Italian peninsula. So yeah, I'm excited to get into this one, so let's jump right in. March 538 AD, Rome. After more than a year, the Ostrogoths have abandoned their siege of the city and are marching north. Eastern Roman general Flavius Belisarius, who's masterminded Rome's defense, has one parting gift. He waits until half the Goth army has crossed the Salarian Bridge, <laughs> then attacks with every man he has. Nice. Fighting is desperate. The Goth rearguard tries to hold back the Romans, but they are overwhelmed. The Goths push and shove to get across the bridge. Those who cannot are slaughtered or drown in the river. I mean, it's, it, it's a good move. Belisarius is generally a very cautious uh, general. So you know that, you know, he must have really valued this opportunity to have taken this action. Um, and it was definitely a smart move. I mean, you know, really squeezing them into this, this narrow bridge, being able to take one final strike at the goth army before they, uh, they make their way up north. Uh, you know, I mean, who am I to say good move to Belisarius, one of the greatest generals of history, but, you know, good move. <laughs> it's a final bloody victory in the battle for Rome. In Constantinople, capital of the Eastern Roman Empire, Emperor Justinian has just overseen construction of the most magnificent church in the world, mm -hmm. the Cathedral of Hagia Sophia, Holy Wisdom. Now... Yeah, and in sort of a very Justinian-esque move, he made sure that it was completed very quickly you know, he completed it years faster than, you know, almost anyone else would have. Um, he wanted it to be built while he was alive. And because of that, there's actually some minor flaws in the construction because Justinian rushed it so much. Um, despite that, it is, you know, it was and remains an extremely impressive, um, you know, piece of architecture. A very impressive building. Very impressive construction process, particularly given how fast it was built. Um, and, and this was, you know, really an important part of Justinian's legacy. You know, this new church, this new shrine to Christianity that was so impressive. Um, it was really, really quite an accomplishment. But it's, it's like most things Justinian did, you know, extremely ambitious um, and not necessarily perfect. Though the Hagia Sophia held up a lot better than most of Justinian's uh, ambitious sort of moves ended up. With God's backing, he's poised to complete another great objective. The reconquest of Italy, the Roman Empire's ancient heartland. But the Emperor himself will help to sow seeds of division among his own armies. Yep. To undermine his greatest general and pave the way for the destruction of one of Europe's great Christian cities. Oh. 
such an epic intro. Uh, they're really good at these. Uh, yes, Belisarius Part 4, the General and the Eunuch. Yeah, we're... They've just laid it out for you, but yeah, we're gonna see the results of some of the uh, dissent against Belisarius sowed by Justinian himself. Or, you could say, taken advantage of by a certain eunuch. I guess that depends on your position. We all need a break from campaigning now and then. Wow. <laughs> a better way to relax than with a spot of fishing. Uh, that came out of nowhere. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, like I always say, shout out to them. Uh, you know, shout out to Epic History TV, their channel. Go check that out in the description. And shout out to their sponsor. Video description. You'll get to visit many eight. Mm -hmm. Has its own you power up your room. Got it. Challenges. Got Use it. code FISH with Epic History to get a welcome pack with $20 worth of in game fishing gear, including a three star rod and a lure for one of the game's rarest fish. Good stuff. So go check out their video. They've got a link to their sponsor in the description. Use their code. Check out the QR code. All of that good stuff. Show them some love. Fishing Clash is free to play on iOS and Android. Mm -hmm. Thanks again to Fishing Clash for sponsoring this video. In 538, Italy's largest and most prosperous city is not Rome or Ravenna, but Milan to the Romans, Mediolanum. Its citizens wish to be reunited with the Empire, and at the Bishop of Milan's request, Belisarius sends a small force to aid them. They defeat local Goth forces at Ticinum, and enter Milan in triumph. But in central Italy, Belisarius faces a dilemma. One of his best generals, John, nephew of Vitalian, has taken Ariminum with 2,000 elite cavalry. Now King Vitigus and the Ostrogoth army is marching from Rome and will soon trap him in the city. Mm -hmm. Belisarius orders two trusted officers to get there first with infantry reinforcements. They are to swap places with John and his valuable cavalry, freeing them up for mobile operations. But when the reinforcements arrive at Ariminum, John refuses to obey Belisarius's orders. Yep. Instead, he adds the infantry to his own force and prepares to hold the city. Within days, John is cut off and under siege. The Goths make their first assault with a giant siege tower. In heavy fighting, the Romans beat them back. But John does not have enough supplies to hold out for long. John's insubordination puts Belisarius' entire campaign in peril. Yeah, it's almost like exactly what Belisarius was worried about is now happening um, because of John's, uh, you know, John disobeying his orders. So, yeah, this is a, I mean... It's frustrating for me. Imagine if you're Belisarius. What a frustrating event. You know, if, if John just followed orders, you'd be in a much better position. But, you know, this is the situation you have to deal with. He will lose some of his best troops if Ariminum falls. But a dash north risks leaving several strong Goth garrisons in his rear, including 10,000 experienced Goth warriors at Auximum. Yep. Belisarius's advance meets with early success, as the Goths at Tudera and Clusium surrender without a fight. As he ponders his next move, news arrives that 7,000 Roman reinforcements have landed near Fermium. Belisarius marches to join them and meet with their commander, one of the most powerful men in the Empire, Narses the Eunuch. Narses, Priapositus Sacri Cubiculi, Grand Chamberlain of the Palace, is Justinian's closest advisor. As a eunuch, he can pose no dynastic threat to the Emperor. Yeah, and this is why, you know, into the uh, Imperial Age, you have eunuchs starting to be used. Um, you know, uh, men who have been, uh, you know, you could say sort of <laughs> compromised down there. Um, because the idea is that if you're a eunuch, well, you can't father any children, 
Therefore, you cannot pose a threat to the emperor's dynasty. You can't have your own kids, so you, know, you can't be emperor and then pass it to your children, so you're less of a threat. Um, and eunuchs, over time, the power of eunuchs progressively increases as they dominate more and more political uh, and bureaucratic positions. Narses is a man that Justinian trusts very much. He's one of his uh, closest men who Justinian would basically trust with any task. Um, uh, and he's been sent to Italy to help out. And so is entrusted with enormous power and influence. Narses had distinguished himself during the Nica riots, bribing sections of the mob to switch sides, while Belisarius and Mundus had dealt more directly with the rest. Mm -hmm. Belisarius has military command in Italy, but he cannot simply issue orders to someone as important as Narses. So he convenes a council of war, seeking agreement on the way forward. Belisarius' officers argue that John has only himself to blame for his fate. They should not risk the army to save him. But Narses is close to John and thinks differently. If John treated your orders with insolence, most excellent Belisarius, he has already been punished enough, since it is now in your power to either save or abandon him to the enemy. But you must ensure that neither we nor the Emperor are also punished for his mistakes. This is, um, it's veiled, but it's a pretty obvious threat. You know, hey, Belisarius, you know, sure, John did something bad, but you need to make sure that, you know, we and the Emperor don't suffer for his mistakes, you know, a.k.a. You've got to do this, or, you know, the Emperor's not going to be happy. For if the Goths capture Ariminum, it will be their good fortune to capture a capable Roman general, as well as an army and city subject to the Emperor. And the disaster will not stop there, but will affect the entire fortune of the war. As the Council meets, a message arrives from John. His men are starving, and unless relieved, he must surrender in seven days. It is agreed that an attempt must be made to rescue John and his troops. In an elaborate operation, a thousand troops are left to cover the Goth garrison at Auximum. One force will advance straight up the coastal road. Another force will move up by sea, threatening an amphibious landing, while Belisarius and Narses march inland and approach from the west. The plan works perfectly. Viticus receives reports of Roman forces closing in from all directions. Fearing encirclement, he abandons the siege and hurriedly withdraws to his capital, Ravenna. But despite their success, all is not well in the Roman camp. When Belisarius invites John to thank those who've come to his rescue, John announces that his only debt is to Narses. His words fuel the growing distrust between Belisarius and Narses. In the words of Procopius, historian and eyewitness, from that time on, these two men began to regard each other with great suspicion. The chain of command among Eastern Roman generals is not always clear yeah. and is rarely set in stone. Referring decisions back to the Emperor takes months so a general's authority may often rest on his ability to win over his senior officers. It's possible Justinian encourages such a system to hinder over-mighty generals who are tempted to challenge his rule. Yeah, so, you know, there's sort of a couple ways to look at this, right? Now, you could say that Justinian sent Narses specifically to disrupt Belisarius. You could frame it as Justinian sent Narses as a trusted subordinate to keep an eye on Belisarius or, you know, to make sure he's not doing anything that would disobey the Emperor's orders. Um, or, so, you know, either that assigns a certain level of blame to Justinian. A higher level or a lower level? Did Justinian really want to disrupt Belisarius? Uh... 
you know, to put him on the back foot, or was he simply sort of trying to keep an eye on him? Uh, you know, you can also think of Narcis. You know, to what extent is Narcis uh, taking what Justinian has said and really running with it? Is Narcis following uh, exactly what Justinian said, or is he taking advantage of Justinian's orders um, to increase his own power? There's obviously a lot of questions here that we don't really know the answer to, um, but we do know that Justinian was suspicious of Belisarius, didn't want him to get too powerful, um, and that he definitely sent Narses to enforce his own power because he trusted Narses so much. He really trusted Narses not to betray him. So, you know, Narses on a certain level is kind of an extension of Justinian's power, um, Obviously, if you're Belisarius, this whole thing must be very frustrating because you've been so successful so far, um, and now due to support, uh, insubordination and the meddling of Narses and, on some level, Justinian, you know, you're having some trouble. Um, so this is this sort of complex palace politics, you know, is playing out on the battlefield, basically. Is this why he has sent Narses to Italy to clip the wings of Belisarius? We don't know. Hard to but tell. But for the war in Italy, the consequences of this system will soon lead to catastrophe. Yeah. John and other discontented officers begin to encourage Narses to oppose Belisarius. It is beneath his dignity, they tell him, to take orders from a mere general. Mm. When Belisarius reveals his plan to methodically eliminate the Goth strongholds in central Italy, Prior to an advance on Ravenna, Narses objects. The strategy is too cautious. Instead, Narses proposes an immediate advance into Emilia to seize more territory from the Goths. In frustration, Belisarius produces a letter from the Emperor. We have not sent our steward Narses to Italy in order to command the army. We wish Belisarius alone to command the whole army in whatever manner seems best to him. It is the duty of all to obey him in the interest of our Republic. To which Narses replies, your strategy is not in the interest of the Republic. So, you know, this is where the question really comes in of to what extent is this Justinian meddling? Because um, Justinian had sent that letter to Belisarius, right? So he's given him the authority to lead as he sees fit. But uh, Narses objects by saying, well, this is not in the interest of the Republic. So you can see that as Justinian directly meddling, or many see it as Narses really stretching the directions given by Justinian in order to justify superseding Belisarius' authority. And I think... I mean, I do think Justinian is trying to meddle, but... I think that interpretation definitely might be accurate. I, I, it really does seem like Narcisse is trying to really stretch what he has from Justinian to justify his own interpretation and to lessen the power of Belisarius, which is obviously really frustrating because, you know, Belisarius' strategy is probably the correct one. I mean, Belisarius is a cautious general, but his caution has thus so far been met with success. He knows what he's doing, and it's all sort of being disrupted now. The army splits into two factions, each pursuing its own strategy. A potentially disastrous situation, but fortunately for the Romans, one which Viticus in Ravenna fails to exploit. Belisarius is able to take Urbino when its well unexpectedly fails. Narses sends John to capture Forum Corneliae in Emilia. But in the north, a storm is brewing. Uh oh This city of Milan far surpasses all the cities of Italy in size and population and every other sort of prosperity. This city, I say, has fallen into great danger. The urgency of the moment does not allow me to use many words. But you, I say, must defend the people of Milan in their peril with all possible speed. If you hesitate to come to us in the present crisis, the result will be that we will perish after suffering the most cruel fate possible. 539 AD. Milan is held by just 300 Roman troops and its citizen militia. 
The mm. Goths have reacted swiftly to its loss, and the city is now besieged by Euraeus, the king's nephew. He is supported by a huge force of Burgundians, sent by Theodobert, king of the Franks, a Goth ally, though how far he can be trusted is anyone's guess. <laughs> yeah. By winter, Milan is starving. Its people are eating mice and dogs. Belisarius, besieging Urvivento, orders a force to march to the city's aid. But when its commanders learn of the size of the Burgundian force, they halt at the River Po and refuse to go further without support from John and his troops in Emilia. By now, John only obeys orders from Narses. Uh -oh. By the time Belisarius has written to Narses and persuaded him of the urgency of the situation, it is too late. The garrison of Milan ignore their commander's plea to die like heroes and negotiate their own surrender. See, this is what happens when you have competing sources of authority, particularly in a military situation, in an urgent military situation. You know, you need those orders fast, and you need people to obey those orders. And when you have insubordination and different sources of authority, everything gets mixed up, everything slows down, and you have situations like this. Abandoning the civilians to their fate. Goths and Burgundians slaughter every male they can find in the city. Women and children are given to the Burgundians as slaves. One of the greatest cities in Italy is plundered and razed to the ground. Jeez. The destruction of Milan is the direct consequence of a fatally divided Roman high command. Yeah, yeah. Shocked into action. Justinian recalls Narses to Constantinople. Belisarius, once more, has sole, undisputed command in Italy. See, and that's sort of an example of Justinian realizing his meddling has gone too far. You know, he's uh, finally realized that, you know, he has this concern about Belisarius and he wants to restrain his power but he needs to allow him a certain amount of power in order to operate effectively. Um, and of course, you know, like we've mentioned throughout this video, there's so many questions about to what extent Justinian really was limiting Belisarius or trying to limit him. To what extent was it uh, Narses? Was it John? You know, we really can't tell too accurately, but we sort of know on a vague level. The northern part of the country has now been ravaged by two years of war, in which time no harvests are gathered. Mm. Vitigus cannot campaign without supplies and remains in Ravenna. Roman forces can be supplied by sea with grain from Sicily and the south. But in the countryside, Italian peasants begin to starve. I will now tell of the appearance they acquired and how they died, for I was an eyewitness. All of them first became lean and pale, for the flesh, lacking nourishment, turned on itself, to use the old expression. As the evil developed, all moisture left them, and the skin became so dry that it resembled leather more than anything else. Man. They changed from a livid to a black color, whereupon they came to resemble burned-up torches. Their faces always wore an expression of amazement and a dreadful sort of insane stare. Proc I mean, you know, this makes me think two things. One, uh, and I've mentioned this in other videos, you know, here we have some of the more unseen victims of war, the civilians. Um, you know, warfare uh, is extremely brutal on the civilian population for either because, I mean, they can be directly killed by uh, a battle or, you know, uh, enemy forces or for more indirect methods like displacement from their homes um, or the destruction of crops, which leads to a famine. Um, you know, famines during wartime are pretty common. Um, and so, yeah, just makes you sort of really empathize with the civilians in this scenario. 
um, and, you know, makes you think about, you know, these are some of the victims of the war, which are not so obvious. Um, the second thing this makes me think is I'm very glad that we have the work of Procopius. I mean, I have been from the beginning. I mentioned this in the first episode. You know, we know a lot of what we know from Procopius, um, but... You know, I've never actually read the work of Procopius, and and this has made me sort of interested in that because uh, Epic History TV has used a lot of his uh, exact words, um, and there's really a lot of detail in here. Um, you know, a lot of good stuff. So we're really lucky to have the work of Procopius. Um, you know, most. Uh, this is why, by the way, we know so much about Justinian Belisarius in this time period is because of the in-depth work of Procopius. Although, of course, there's, uh, you know, the question of to what extent we should take his word in his, you know, main public history and, you know, his secret history, in which he's a lot, you know, extremely negative about men like Belisarius and Justinian. Um, but regardless, you know, his work is very invaluable in studying this period. Copius estimates that famine claims 50,000 lives in Picanum Jeez. alone, with bodies wow. left unburied and rumors of cannibalism. Yeah, that's brutal. But when King Theodobert himself suddenly leads a great Frankish army into northern Italy, attacking Goths and Romans alike, he finds he has entered a wasteland. His army, unable to find supplies and decimated by disease and dysentery, quickly withdraws back across the Alps. The war grinds on as Belisarius besieges the Goth strongholds at Faisulae and Auximum. Auximum is impregnable. Only starvation will force the Goths to give up. Skirmishes are fought in the surrounding hills as each side ambushes the enemy's foraging parties. Belisarius is amazed by the Goths' determination. Mm. Eventually, he learns from a prisoner that one of his own men has been passing messages from Viticus to the garrison, promising help, urging them to hold out a little longer. Belisarius arrests the traitor <laughs> and sends him back to his unit for them to punish as they see fit. They burn yeah. him alive in full view of the enemy. God damn. Yeah, that is an extremely uh, traumatic way to go, but, you know, punishment was definitely in line. The garrisons of Faisulae, then Auximum, are finally starved into surrender. Belisarius grants them both generous terms. Then, with his rear secure, he begins his advance on Ravenna. Mm -hmm. Reinforcements from Dalmatia approach from the north. Ravenna is protected by a lagoon, marshes, and shoals along the coast. Parts of its nine-meter-high brick curtain wall can still be seen today, incorporated into later Venetian fortifications. It is strongly held. But the Roman noose is tightening. A vital grain shipment along the Po River is intercepted. A mysterious fire breaks out in the city's granary. The Goth king puts much hope in his nephew, Eureus, approaching with a relief force of 4,000 men. But when the troops learn that their own strongholds have gone over to the Romans, they leave for home. Yikes. In despair, Vitigus agrees to open negotiations. Imperial envoys arrive from Constantinople, but the treaty they offer to Vitigus is so generous that Belisarius refuses to sign it, believing he's on the cusp of complete victory. Yep. Without Belisarius' endorsement, the Goths also regard the treaty with suspicion. Sidelining King Vitigus, Goth nobles send their own delegation to Belisarius. And once again, with this whole action going on, uh, you know, you can see why Justinian becomes suspicious. Look at the level of authority Belisarius holds on the field. He's making peace deals, uh, you know, that are separate from the official deals offered by, um, you know, Roman delegates. Uh, and he is, you know, goth 
lords are coming straight to him, you know, sidelining the, their king. You know, Belisarius holds a really high level of authority here and a high level of power. So Justinian's meddling is very frustrating and, uh, you know, it's it doesn't really lead to many good outcomes. But as I mentioned before, you can see why he has this suspicion of Belisarius. Whether or not Belisarius has the intention to, you know, raise himself up to emperor or whatever... Whether or not that's true, you know, because of his position, he just has this high level of authority. With a secret offer to make him Emperor of the West, if he yep. will guarantee their security, Belisarius swears only that no harm will come to the Goths if they surrender. And th I mean, this is it, you know, Justinian's worst fear. Um, they offer him, you know, this position, Emperor of the West. I mean, in reality, there's only so much they can really offer him with all the territory that's been lost. But, you know, they offer him this position. And, you know, this is another one of those situations where Belisarius never goes through with it. We don't know what he was thinking. Um, but just the fact that these situations present themselves makes Justinian nervous. An oath to rule over the Goths, he will swear later, before Viticus himself. Mm -hmm. The Goth delegation is satisfied. What man would turn down the offer of a crown? The gates of the city are opened, and Belisarius marches into Ravenna at the head of his troops. He ensures grain arrives in the city quickly. Then he tells the Goth warriors, who outnumber the Romans, to disperse back to their homes. There is no plundering of private property, and no violence. Yep. Belisarius has triumphed. But it will soon emerge he is not playing straight with the Goths. While I watched the entry of the Roman army into Ravenna at that time, it occurred to me that the outcome of events is determined not by the wisdom of men, nor any other virtue on their part, but that there is some supernatural power that is ever warping their intentions and leading them in such a way that nothing will hinder that which is being brought to pass. For though the Goths were greatly superior to their enemy in number and power, and had neither lost a great battle nor been humbled by any other disaster, still they were made captives by the weaker army and regarded the name of slavery as no insult. <laughs> the days pass. The Goths await an announcement from Belisarius that he will crown himself Emperor of the West and rule over them. It never comes. Belisarius has no intention of betraying the Emperor. Yep. He's allowed the Goths to think that he'll accept their offer, only to end the war as swiftly as possible. The Goths begin to feel they've been tricked, betrayed even. Suspicions which are confirmed when Belisarius is recalled to Constantinople. He leaves with the Goth treasury and his prisoners, including Vitigus. As far as we can tell, Belisarius is loyal. Like I said, we don't know what he's thinking, but every time Justinian sun summons him back, he goes. You know, he always goes and uh, submits himself to the emperor, even when he's in positions like this or in Africa. Um... You know, it it seems like he truly is loyal to the Emperor, but Justinian just can't shake that suspicion. Belisarius' rivals ensure that Justinian hears all about the Goths' offer of an imperial throne. Yep. But for the moment, the Emperor faces a far greater concern. Mm -hmm. One of Viticus's last acts as king had been to send two secret agents to the court of King Hosro in far-off Persia, with a plea for aid against their shared enemy, the Eastern Roman Empire. Hosro needs no encouragement. He's been watching as Justinian strips his eastern frontier of troops for his wars in the west. Now, Sasanian armies are on the march. Hosro has set his sights on Antioch, second city of the empire capital of the Roman Near East. 
Uh, I'll let it finish before I speak. Justinian believes only one man can stop him. Belisarius. <laughs> Thank you again to okay. our video sponsor. Go check out their video and their sponsor and everything. Yeah, Kuzro is a really fascinating figure in his own right. Um, you know, he was a great leader of Persia. Um, he also had a lot of great achievements. Um, you know, definitely uh, an appropriate rival to Justinian. Um, but yeah, you know, that was a great video. You know, we're seeing sort of the interplay between Justinian and Belisarius's authority. Um, Belisarius, as always, <laughs> you know, successful, a great general, seems to be loyal, uh, as far as we can all tell. And, you know, this also gives us an opportunity to talk about the conquest of Italy and Justinian's ambitions, because this is a great achievement, you know? Italy has been reconquered, Africa's been reconquered. You know, Ju Justinian has a lot of great achievements throughout his reign, um, and a lot of people remember him fondly and, and really like Justinian. But the issue with Justinian that comes up with all of his achievements is that they mostly crumble after he's gone. You know, he he just, the empire cannot maintain these grandiose uh, achievements of Justinian's. They cost too much money. They take too much manpower. You know, they're just unsustainable. And so, you know, while Justinian is certainly a, a skillful, intelligent, ambitious leader, he doesn't leave the empire in a great place because, and this is my opinion, he doesn't leave the empire in a great place because his, you know, his achievements can't be maintained, and they're not maintained. You know, a lot of the stuff he does sort of falls apart. That's what I was saying earlier when I said the, the Hagia Sophia is uh, one of his more sustainable achievements. It lasts. Um, most of the other stuff he does does not last. Um, but, you know, there's differing opinions on Justinian. Um, so, you know, you can let me know what you think of him. That's, that's sort of what I think. I'm not denying he's a very skillful, ambitious guy. I just think that ambition, in the end, was, you know, maybe not necessarily too beneficial to the Eastern Roman Empire. Um, but, yeah... I'm excited to, uh, you know, get into the next episode. We've got to, to Khosrow and the Persians, uh, one of the Romans' great rivals. In fact, kind of like the great rival of the Romans throughout uh, their history. Um, so yeah, I enjoyed this one. Hope you guys did. Uh, if you did, please leave a like, subscribe, check out the Patreon, all that good stuff. Um, uh, you know, I hope all you guys are having a, a good day, a good time, uh, and I'll see you all again next time. Goodbye.